politics. Like rocket <laughs> Water and Sir Advisory Committee's regular meeting on August 13th, 2015 at 5.30 p.m. We are going to go to number two, adoption of the agenda. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Do we have a second? We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, approval of the minutes for the May 14th, 2015 meeting. We did not have a meeting in June or July, so this has been the last meeting. Jim, not to be obtuse, but you should ask if anybody has a, uh, a nay on each one, not just if they have a... No. There might be somebody that has an objection. Do you have anything you'd like I to... I said yay for the... Uh, but I just... Okay. If Carmen was here, I'm sure he'd point out... Robert's rules. And... All right, we will do that next time. <laughs> do we have a mo Has everybody read the the approval of last month? Approve them. Any corrections? Do we have a motion to approve the minutes of May 14th? Do we have a second? All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Motion to carry. <laughs> Officer elections. <laughs> elections I'm... shall be conducted annually at the first scheduled meeting following June 30th, which is tonight. Nominations for the voting members, but, excuse me, nominations by the voting members shall be accepted from the floor and a successful candidate shall be elected by majority vote. Term for office for the position of chairman and vice chairman It'll be one year with the right to succeed himself or herself for one additional term. <clears throat> How do y'all wish we have any thought on, we can do it by voice or by I would, I think paper? Voice. How, Wally, how do you think? You need to do it by nomination and then vote. But do you want to do it by and a, a written That's ballot? That's you need to do it. Mm -hmm. I would not do it written. Yeah, because we can't have secret ballots, so you have to put your name on it anyway. Okay, the floor is open for nominations for the chairman. I would like to add that everybody is eligible this year. Mm -hmm. So last year was the, uh, Mr. Dorm was not able to be vice chair because he had previously been vice chair, and Mr. Agona had been the chair prior, so, but everybody is eligible this year. Why not leave Mr. James Dorn? I say. I say. <laughs> Any more nominations? That's only if he wants it. All right. Do you want to do it one at a time then? Is that how you. And that is up to you. You can do one and vote on chair, and then you can do okay. vice chair. Vote for the chair. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. <laughs> we have that. Vice Chairman, do we have a nomination? I nominate Julie Yusuf for Vice Chair. Second. Second. <laughs> she came back out now too late. <laughs> do we have any additional nominations? Okay, nominations are closed. Everybody in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. Okay. Got that. Thank you, guys. Smoke testing report by Mr. Deaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, committee members. Um, as you know, we experienced some significant rain events over the past few months, and one of the things we experienced was um, several lift stations would go up, uh, into our high alarm rather quickly which to us triggered that we were getting in some a lot of inflow so uh, we once the weather broke and we had some dry weather we did smoke testing in the georgetown sewer basin area which is over off of georgetown road obviously over by on Wasa's building the board of education and we also did over in the belfort homes area which is the belfort basin those were the two that went the highest the quickest um, 
those results were not as beneficial as we had anticipated. We did find some smoking guns, some broken clean out caps. Uh, we did find one that was catching some ditch water. Um, we have since repaired those and uh, in the Georgetown area. In the Bell Fork area, we did find uh, some storm catch basins that were smoking, meaning we were taking in rainwater runoff directly off the curb and gutters. Um, so we followed that up with some camera work and we found out that we've got some really good uh, line segments that are candidates for the slip lining project. Uh, one in particular is underneath Hargett Street. Uh, obviously that's a DOT road, so we DOT would not be real happy with me if I dug that road up. Yes, ma'am. I thought everything was done on Hargett Street before DOT paved it. Not, not every line segment was done, no. The ones that were um, up towards the New River area, those uh -huh. were done. But there is one segment down towards the Country Club end um, near uh, Cole Drive, somewhere in that area, that did have some smoke coming out of it. We put camera there and we did find some infiltration, some inflow, so it will be put on the next lining project. And it will be, it will not be invasive to the road. We won't have to tear out any infrastructure. We'll just line it and uh, do one there. Then we did one on uh, uh, Carver. We found one on Carver that was smoking also in Bell Fork Homes. So we'll be, we'll be lining those lines and hopefully that'll reduce some of our inflow in those particular areas. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. When you say it'll be done next, <clears throat> what time frame is that? The next slip lining project, and I'm not, not trying to be sarcastic, but I think this, this is a design year. Yes. And next year, which would be FY17, um, is the next lining project year. So it would be FY17. Okay, and the reason I ask that is because if it's like 2018, we have a number of hurricane seasons coming up before then, that this mm -hmm. will continue to be a problem. Mm -hmm. And I assume since it's being folded in that way, that it won't be an increase to the budget. It'll just be <coughs> what you choose what's already budgeted for will really apply to that. That's yeah, correct. And that's, that, that's what we're out looking for now, is things to include into that project. Okay. We, have, we have a growing list of line segments, and then when we get to the dollar amount that's budgeted, we'll just we'll prioritize and see which ones are the worst, which one is going to give us the best return on our investment, and we'll line those segments first. Okay. That begs the question what we do, what will be done between now and that project in 2017 because again we're not done till november this year with the hurricane you'll have a full hurricane season next year plus the springs have become a little more rain oriented so you'll have some more events coming up i take it what is there uh, something that we can mitigate that or is that going to be just have to live with it we implement the contingency plan to control the flow so we don't have overflows okay um Realistically, right now, that's all I can do is try to contain it and control the flows. So you're looking at least 12 months before you're able to fix it? Unless it has a catastrophic collapse. If it has a catastrophic collapse, then we'll go in and fix it right now as soon as it happens. But yes, okay. if it's, you know, no significant signs, I mean, there's infrastructure failure, but if it's deemed that it's strong enough to hold, we'll, we'll postpone it until the lining project starts. But you're going to have the alarms no matter what. Then. <clears throat> yes, that's a given. And and yes, sir. Uh, I was wondering about the uh, the rainwater we had recent. Was there any adverse effect on the uh, systems? Yes. Uh, did it show you where you needed to do something different? Yes, sir. And the uh, levels at the uh, wastewater treatment plant. How were they? Okay, uh, I'll take the, the first part of your question first. Uh, the rain, the significant rain events did impact our system. We did have a, a sewer overflow from the rain. The uh, I think it was July 23rd. We had the 6.5 inches of rain in about three hours. We did have a spill on Western Boulevard at, uh, in front of 409 Western Boulevard, and it came out of that manhole and went directly into the storm drain. They're about five feet apart and every bit of it ran straight into the storm drain. We contacted DWQ, followed their remediation protocol, and uh, everything's fine. Um, second part of your question, we, during that same rain event, I had about seven or eight stations that went into high alarm at the same time. Um, our alarms are set 
as low as we could possibly set them to give us reaction time. So obviously if we raised them, we wouldn't have so many alarms, but um, with 45 stations and only a few, you know, a few people that can respond, we set them as low as we can to give us reaction time. Uh, so we did have, but it was the only significant impact was that spill that we had on the 23rd. With, other than overtime with the one on western boulevard <clears throat> since it was associated with the rain that would make you assume that i and i was influencing it so are you looking in that area to see what i and i might be leading to the the overflow on western boulevard that that is in the works there is there were uh, several and i i had updated management mr hansen and city manager's office there were several <clears throat> contributing factors to that one is uh, a segment of the pipe that is severe tuberculation in it it's a 12 inch pipe that's cast iron is now down to about nine and a half inches in diameter which creates a bottleneck um, and there's also a couple of lift stations in close proximity to each other that were double pumping and both of the full meaning the force mains were pushing as much as they could possibly push into a 12 inch pipe uh, into uh, you know upstream and downstream of where the overflow was located so that didn't help either um, and it was just a everything i mean you get six and a half inches of rain in three hours nobody can handle that no system <clears throat> and it just it pointed out a significant point yet yeah, but to answer your question yes we are looking uh we're watching run times start times inflow from the flow meters we're checking everything that we can check and eventually we'll get to the point where we can camera it and or smoke test it again try to find out where it's coming does a manhole overflow always indicate a sewage spill Yes. Whether it's reportable or not is anything over a thousand gallons in quantity or any amount that reaches the state what deemed as state waters. So if it goes into a catch basin or into an theoretically into an open ditch, that is considered state waters and it is considered reportable regardless of the quantity. But if it is more than a thousand gallons, uh, it is required to be reported as a reportable overflow to the state. And this spill was about three thousand gallons. You said we talked about a couple of significant events. None of these significant events were significant as far as the budget was concerned. Every event impacts the budget. I understand, but it was within the budget. Well, there there is not just to steal Mr. Hansen's thunder. There is an item on there about LTS update, mm -hmm. um, which has had some significant impact on the budget that he will go over. Uh, but to answer Mr. Holland's the third part of his question, the wastewater plant will also be addressed in that. Uh, and that last budget item that Mr. Hudson's going to discuss. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have any questions? Pete? Okay. Number six, LTS update. Our director. Mr. Chairman, board. Uh, we wanted to give you an update of the land treatment site. Uh, as you'll recall, uh, back at the end of February, we were in an emergency spring. That means that our lagoon levels were at 12 and a half feet in the east and west lagoons and about 14 feet in the south lagoon. So we were at freeboard. So giving you an update of where we stand um, currently, our lagoon levels are down to 6.4 feet and that's in all three lagoons because we've balanced them out. As you'll see, that's slightly different than what's reported in your um staff report but what we did is move we actually moved some water around in addition to spraying that we've been able to um perform we have we've been watching our the performance of our field our sprinkler field as you know we have um north of 20,000 spray nozzles closer to 21,000. um we have right now we're sitting at about 84% of our nozzles are on. Um, compared to back in May, we were somewhere around 67%. Um, and July a year ago, we were somewhere around 73%. So um, you can see that we are, there's significant improvement there. And, you know, while it's not possible to get 100%, that's, you know, that's where we're aiming. Um, our average influent for the month of July was 4.4 million gallons per day. Um, of course, that's an average, but that does include the rain events. 
and our average effluent was six million gallons a day. So we put out, the, the good news is that we put out more than we actually took in. And again, those are averages. Some days it's much higher than that um, on the effluent or the influent, and some days it's lower. But, you know, it depends on which pods are paired with other pods in spraying. But if you have a great pod, you can't spray it every day. So um, we do we do maximize our operations to try to get as much water out as we can. Um, some of the things that have contributed to the, you know, additional sprinklers being turned on or, um, you know, the us being able to uh, do so well with our lagoons come with, of course, drier weather. But staff efforts really can be pared down to about five areas. Um, those include daylighting. Um, basically, daylighting is a program that we've put together that consists of mowing, us going in and taking out the underbrush, um, mowing the weeds and things that grow, um, going in and um, taking out smaller trees, um, limbing if we need to, and in addition, selectively taking out some trees that we need to um, and then um, looking at opening our lanes up and the two pictures you see are kind of a before <coughs> and after admittedly they are not the exact same lane um, but if you if you see in the top picture the bottom right here there's a sprinkler head and of course you can see everything and I know it blends in but the next one is right here in front of that lighter colored tree so you can see that the lateral, which is the line of sprinklers, runs kind of this direction. Um, you can see the, the drastic difference between that and the bottom picture. And of course the bottom picture is the ideal condition. That's where we've gone in and we've um, cut everything back. We've tried to open that lane up. And the advantage to that, as you can imagine, we get more sunlight, more wind, so we get evaporation, transpiration, and our, we can actually get the water further into the trees. Um, so all of those have made a, a, a great improvement and um, it also opens up and makes it easier for us to maintain our laterals and our sprinklers. Um, other efforts are cyclic mowing. As everybody knows, we've had some rain this year, so grass grows. As you can imagine, we have 7,200 acres. Um, not all of it's grass, but all of it grows. So um, we do a lot of mowing. Um, and then one of the things that we have focused on uh, this summer that we have not done as good a job in the past is focusing on ditch maintenance. And that actually comes out of a recommendation where uh, Pete and William, our chief operator, went down and met with the state and they actually recommended doing some ditch maintenance because um, while that doesn't get, you know, our, our wastewater is concentrated to the field, but what that does do is help naturally applied rainwater move away from us faster. So it, allow, it does help improve the uptake of our system. So um, Williams had a um, almost a dedicated equipment operator um, for several weeks now doing primarily ditch maintenance. Um, so those are three of the efforts that we have going. Yes, sir. Uh, that lower picture, it looks like, you know, that, that lane has got a lot of no growth there. Is that achieved with herbicides or is that? Uh, we do use herbicides, but that was actually achieved through mowing. And then um, we also come <clears throat> through and cultivate. We use a plow. Um, and we also have a, um, a single tine that's about um, two feet, 18 inches long, that we can come through and try to break up the hard pan underneath it so that water actually goes into the ground easier. But that, I don't think that area was achieved by herbicide. But yeah, we do I, use herbiciding. I, I asked the question, I was hoping you would give an indication that you're using mechanical more than herbicides because of the problems with herbicides if you use them extensively we we do we use both um 
I would say this year has primarily been mechanical. In the past, we have used herbicides, but what happens over time with herbicides is the plants actually build somewhat of immunity to it. So they become less and less effective. Um, along with, and I'll get to it in just a minute, is, you know, we also do, we have a, a forester that comes out and, for, and helps us and provides recommendation, and they use herbiciding also. Um, so we do, that is one of the tools in the toolbox, but it's not the one that we always choose. And you and understand my concern for overuse of herbicides. Yes, and this year we've actually focused on mechanical. Uh, about what percentage of the lanes do you think you've reached with the, the renovations so far? Um, a small percentage. Okay. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so, so you hope over the next X we, period of time to... We actually are, you know, some of this is experimental, trying to figure out what works well. Um, you know, and as you can see, that's very time-consuming. I was going to say, do you have a staff for that? That looks labor-intensive. It, it is labor-intensive. Um, so, and I, and you're, you're preceding some of what I'll talk about. Um, but we do have, we have dedicated some staff to focus on that. Um, and what we will be doing over the next, you know, this year we are trying to take action as things, as you can imagine, um, this is the time of year to do things like this. You know, in the winter it's naturally wetter, um, groundwater elevation is higher, um, so we don't have the luxury of taking action. So one of the things that we plan to do this winter is look at some of the things that we've tried and come up with a plan to where we do get to every part of our um, of land, land app. So we're moving forward, but I don't know. William Mike could quote how many lanes they've done, but I don't know. Yes. Have you ever thought of using something like goats or sheep? To, <laughs> I, I, I'm serious about that. They, you know, I have a, an uncle that was a farmer and he wanted to expand his pasture and the first thing he did was put goats. And yeah. they went in they, they and they for about yeah. five feet off the ground, everything was gone. I've, I've been on so, military bases that use sheep around their ammunition dumps and just to, for the sole purpose of reducing manpower <coughs> and equipment maintenance and it works. You, yeah, you just I, want to keep them away from the actual yeah, risers I mean, and heads so they don't try um, chewing on those, they, too. They won't chew on those if there's enough foliage available. But uh, I think you could probably uh, approach North Carolina State or somebody, one of the universities, and probably get them to lend you some goats for a trial if you wanted to do it's, it. Uh, that's an interesting concept I had not thought of. I think there's somebody around that. here that actually leases their goats yeah, there are, out there are. I, to, to I do admit that. that. There's a, um, I did, when they put the bypass <clears> in, <throat> right behind the Walmart that's on Yop Road, on the, on the opposite side there were goats. Oh, yeah, and they, they had were, that They were blast to watch, yep. I, I take it, even though you're saying that this is labor intensive, there is a return in the efficiency of the land app as a result. Yes. Yeah, we're seeing uh, when we spray an area instead of a three to four day recovery, we're down to a one to two day recovery. Even with all the rain this year, that's yes. really good. Yeah, yes. it is. It, so far, we are seeing huge benefits, which is a significant. Even though it is more manpower intensive, it, that is cheaper than buying more land. That is correct. So. Uh, combination of goats and deep tillage <laughs> to uh, break up the hard pan might be the key. You could get the goats in the spring and let them work all the time and then when the fall comes around you could have a, a massive hunt and this could be a great, <laughs> could be a great tourist attraction. Um, other uh, staff efforts not answer that. Uh, are what we call pod rehabilitation and that somewhat works hand in hand with the um, daylighting program. While the daylighting program is not exactly a new concept, we've had that for a couple of years now, um, we have changed the methods and, and what the tools that we use, um, for, ex for example, going through and cultivating or, or you know, using that single time to plow. Um, but with pod rehabilitation, we have 
three people that are essentially dedicated to going into um, a pod or an area and identifying problems and fixing them while they're there. So areas where we have um, broken regulators or missing whips or sprinklers or, or clogs or anything along those lines, they go through, identify them, fix them, take care of them, and if there's a larger problem, they identify that for additional maintenance. Um, and that program seems to have worked really well. Um, it's a combination of three people. Um, we have one operator and one maintenance person that's paired together, and then as a third kind of floater, they'll either use an operator, another operator or another maintenance person, depending on staffing that's available. Um, or if there is some sort of, um, you know, lane or, or ground um, repairs that need to be made, they can pair an equipment operator with them. So it, it leads for some flexibility. And that is actually a strategy that, that William has developed and implemented, and that seems to be working very well. Um, and I think that if you look at the, you know, I mentioned at the start that we had, when we look back at July of last year, and we had 73% approximately of our sprinklers online, and now we're at 84. I think daylighting and the pod rehab really show um, the effort that Williams put into that. And then, of course, we have ongoing and maintenance and repair. Um, the large pipe that you see at the top right corner is a project that Pete and William just finished. Um, that was a valve replacement project. We actually replaced four 36-inch valves. Um, so that was, obviously, that was time-consuming and a lot of work. But we bought the valves in last year's budget, two years ago budget, and Last year, we budgeted for the repair and got the purchase order under, so we were waiting for it to dry out to actually go in and do the work. So, um, but we've replaced all, all four valves now, um, and we've actually replaced additional smaller valves in-house. Um, when we, I mean, sorry, when Pete um, has staff available from, their, from his line maintenance side, he will actually send them out and help Williams maintenance staff make piping and valve repairs in the field. So um, that partnership and, and they have um, a product called Blue Frog. And basically, the Blue Frog is a new, somewhat revised concept to aeration. Their claims are that by changing out our, our aerators in our aerated lagoons, that we can go to um, what they've termed as bio-dredging. Basically, the sludge will start to break down itself and they will be able to reduce some of our sludge so that we don't have to mechanically dredge, which we are getting right at the point now where we're going to have to do something um, fairly soon. So if while it wouldn't eliminate all the sludge, um, you know, their claims are that they could, they could eliminate a, a large portion of it, and they're willing um, to back um, their claims with, you know, some sort of guarantee. So... Uh, William and Jill and Pete and I, did you go? No, you stayed. It was William and Jill and I went to um, visit several plants that actually use this. And I can tell you that the plant operator at those plants, while they are much smaller than us, are firm believers in the product. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, one of the gentlemen said, I had to use a tractor to drag them in through the sludge. It was so deep, it was so thick. And he said that it worked. Um, you know, we, we have con some concerns. We have Greg looking at the calculations they've submitted. Of course, this could lead to some sort of modification to our permit with the state. So because our aeration system is specifically detailed out in our permit, so we might would have to modify our permit or 
um, get some sort of permission to do a pilot project or a pilot study. Um, what we're looking at right now is um, we have, you've been the land app, you know that we have six aeration ponds, three small ones, three larger ones. Um, what we're looking at is taking one of the larger ones and switching out to blue frog and leaving the other two as they are and then we can actually run side by side by side comparisons and you know of course one of the, one of our big concerns would be monitoring water quality as they left the aerated lagoon so we could actually see performance you had said the other places that you went and looked were much smaller yes does the company say it will work on the bigger ones the bigger ponds their claim is that it will work on the bigger ones um they have provided greg with multitude of calculations that i can't begin to understand do they have any place um, that they're actually using it on ponds that big no we would be by far their largest and and when i say big the ponds that they're using them in some of the other the ponds are bigger mm -hmm. but the plant is actually smaller and they're you know theirs are actually treatment lagoons not you know aeration lagoons that they move mm -hmm. you know i think i think the largest of the two we went to look at was three or four hundred thousand gallons a day you know, and one of our trains is essentially, if you look at an average 6 MD, MGD influent, three trains, you know, we're, we're 2 MGD. Um, so, you know, we're significantly larger. The one, the one concern in, in, our, in our review or our analysis of the data they've provided is contact time. They, you know, they claim they need a certain contact time for the water to remain in the lagoon to keep the digestion pro process optimized. And their contact time is, you know, in the 20s days. And our contact time is like four or five days. So that is, that is one of our larger, of course, you know, if you look at size they're adding additional aerators that they say will compensate for that but those are um those are all things that we're trying to take into consideration before we move forward and admittedly it's not a cheap investment um i want to say to do one of our larger aeration lagoons it was somewhere in the three hundred thousand dollar range and that was i don't know if you recall but right at the end we ask you to add a capital project to the cip um during your review that project was included um so we actually do have this in the cip it is funded but um obviously we're not going to move forward unless we're pretty sure that everything will work as it's been presented um the one thing that i that is beneficial is if it does not um break down the sludge as they said of course i said they have a guarantee they're willing to um i think it's refund 75 percent of our investment everything except the engineering cost um back to us of course they take their equipment back we'll still have our old equipment so we can just put it right back in place um but their the way their aerators function and the size motors it is a significant energy savings and I don't remember the, the energy saving, savings, but I, I think one one train was somewhere in the forty to fifty thousand dollars a year, based on you know kilowatt hours that and and price per kilowatt. It wasn't our actual, but they used a standard. Um, so there would, but even if it, it weren't that high, there would be significant energy saving costs. If you didn't use this, what would you be doing with that sludge? we would it, essentially we drain that we take that aeration lagoon offline mm -hmm. we drain it down to the point that we can um and they mechanically Second. pull it out mm -hmm. put it in a dump truck and haul it to a field somewhere and then turn it under okay. um which has as you can imagine all kinds of permitting challenges and finding fields that can take it and it's um you can't just take that to the county landfill no and price would be yeah, astronomical um have you had to do it before for that we one? we have i think we did it last in 2011 mm -hmm. or 12. do you recall what it cost then 
300,000 to, to do one aeration? No, it was two, I think. How far away did they have two. to go? I think it was 215. How how we, far, I don't far. remember where we had to take it, but it was in, it I think it was in far. the general vicinity, but I do remember there being... Um, that was for two mm -hmm. ponds? That was for, I think that was two ponds, yes. Big or small? The, I think it was, I, actually, I think it was two trains, the big and the small, so four, actually four ponds, four of the six. Mm. The reason we didn't do the other two is they were fairly new, new from the expansion. I'm assuming there's a restriction on you putting that muck on the... On, no human uh, consumption. On the uh, LTS, on that pro part of the property that's not used for spray. It would have to be permitted. The land would have to be permitted, and then there are certain... You have to have, Jill has looked at this, she can answer that question pretty detailed. But at one time we did have permits to do something like that when we were at Old Wilton Bay. Mm -hmm. um, but we still use farmer's fields because of um, the amount of land that you would need. And once you do it, you can't come back to it for so many years. So it's not like you could use, you know, five years from now, you use the exact same plot of land. But there is a lot of land at the LTS that's there is. unused as far as the spray fields go. Yes, but there's also a lot that's wet. Okay. So it is a, it is something that we're looking at. It has a lot of potential. Um, and part of our concern is it's almost the too good to be true. So. How long have these other places had this system? Or is this something brand new? Three, I think one of the ones that we went to was about three years. And he, he had, um, they had just measured his sludge, I think two or three weeks before we got there. Mm -hmm. And he was down to sub foot and he started with like four feet. But so. it wasn't all up there in suspension instead. Correct, it was not all up in suspension. And he, they, they actually, they're, you know, they had to measure total suspended solids and BODs, and his numbers had actually improved. And they, they supplied us with detailed pre and after of, you know, all of the tests that they were required to run and submit. They've been very, I have to admit, they have been very open with information and when we went and toured the plants they actually um, let us talk with the um, operator and uh, the you know the marketing person for the company that uh, set everything up actually just walked away and I actually made a comment to to one of the operators and I said you know you sound like a blue frog salesman and his response was no but I'm a believer yeah. So, it, it it has a lot of potential. So we you know we've just got to you know it, we've got to get through you know permitting and making sure that contact time is not a problem. Um, and one of the you know it, it's one of those that as interested as we are in them, they're as interested in us because they don't have anything as large as our system. So they're. They want to prove that their system can work in a system as large as ours. Are they a new company, fairly new? Um, within the last five years, I think. It, it may have been eight. Uh, is there anything about maintaining those aerators that you think is going to be a problem? Or they're, they actually, they're actually easier to maintain than the aerators that we have. Well, we'd be going from 10 and 50 horsepower aerators to 3 and 5 horsepower aerators. So, so you've got the energy savings. Yes, that's that's where the energy savings mm -hmm. comes in. And to clear these, you actually just run them in reverse. They're made to be run mm -hmm. in reverse. So I'm taking it and sucking the water up into either. it and then spreading it out across out. the surface. Yes, and if you when you've been to our lagoons, you're used to seeing the mm -hmm. fountain look. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, these, you know, it it breaks the surface of the water, but there's no, you know, it looks more like ripples coming out. <clears throat> <away. clears throat> so I 
take it, they have to have enough of them out there to give the proper radius coverage, and that's part of the engineering design? That's correct. Because your and pond being <coughs> bigger, they're going to need more than one. That's correct. Oh, and yeah. for the state, you know, the state's worried about dissolved oxygen, mm -hmm. so they have to um, make sure that they provide enough to meet the dissolved oxygen requirements. It, it works out to... Um, we have six now, but they don't always run, and we would be going to somewhere around um, 12 or 14, if uh, I remember the design correctly. Not a big one. Not a big lagoon. Not in the big lagoon, yes. So it, it's very interesting. Um, as we move forward, certainly we'll be coming back with more information. How do um, they tether them in place? They're, they're actually tethered by rope, which is ours are done by cable now. So th that part's very similar. And we make and reuse the anchor. Um, we, we would have to do additional electrical work out there because obviously there's more of them. How do they put the baffles out there? They're just, they're curtains. They float. But how are they put in place to be however distance away from the Blue Frog unit? It had a, they had, um, I don't remember if they were aluminum or stainless, just bars that came out, but they're just, they're sort just of spread away. Yes. And are they in a circle around the gizmo? Uh, yes, they were in a circle, and not all of them use the curtains. So some, some have curtains, and some do not, and that's based on their design. I don't know how they calculate which need them and which don't. Um, one other effort that staff is um, considering is we're looking at a possible grant opportunity that would be a partnership with NC State University. Um, we've the the application has just been submitted within the last two weeks, I think. Um, NC State did take the lead on that, um, and they actually approached us, and um, I the. Um, the purpose of the grant or what's driving the grant, it's actually a federal grant that's put on, um, that's, that's out with um, EPA. It's a combination of EPA and I do not remember the other federal agency. I want to say and USDA, I'm not sure. It may be USDA. And part of what's driving this is, you know, out west has been, you know, hit with a drought. And also out west is large agricultural uses, um, which put large demand on water supply. And part of what's driving this is looking at um, what they're calling personal care products, um, your lotions, your um, soaps, shampoos, conditioners, um, detergents, you know, fabric softener, pharmaceuticals. And, you know, things that are actually made for human consumption that we don't currently monitor for because we don't have to. But what, what happens to those? And um, along with, you know, municipal wastewater and any industrial, if you have it, which we really, you know, we really don't have any industrial wastewater. And how systems like ours, land application sites, how good of a job that they do in treating um, for all of those contaminants. And, um, you know, our contact with NC State is very convinced that our systems probably do a better job than traditional type, where it's just direct, you know, they, they treat um, it to tertiary level and secondary, I always get that part confused, and discharge, yeah. and discharge directly into surface water. Mm -hmm. um, God, you know, the right. belief is that our, the, our type of system is more environmentally friendly and does a much better job. <clears throat> and um, there's a, a piece of this will be to look at um, public perception right. of extending um, the application crop to even things that would be available for human consumption. And of course, there's a perception issue there. Um, so that's part of this grant too. Um, part of the benefit for the city is 
if we, you know, there are, there is opportunity that if we can show how good of a job our system actually does and we have some real data, it may could help us in our permitting in the future. Um, one of the things that we've talked about several times is, you know, we had a consultant that basically said there is no more land for irrigation at the land application site and there were really to expand. However, you know, as part of this grant, we would actually look at, well, what if we got away from just municipal land and we actually got into um, crops, whether that be um, others that have large acreage timber crops in the area or even farm crops that we could um, use in the future. So there could, so that's another piece of this where um, it could be a, a big advantage to identifying potential uses in the future for future city expansion. Um, so, and of course, if if NC State is um, in the city are selected for the grant, then we would actually go to council and say, are you interested in participating in um, working with NC State on this effort? Because we've got a lot of rain now, but it wasn't that long ago that the state was quite dry. You're correct. We flip back and forth. So we do. We do. Being able to, to utilize it. I mean, out west has been having a really rough time. and yeah, They have a steady pattern, at least out west, yeah. They do, and <laughs> several weeks ago, um, they had something on NPR about a municipality out there that the farmers around there are looking at, you know, can we use your water, and the municipalities below them, and if they're a discharge site and the municipalities below them don't want the farmers to get the water because they want it to be put back in the river so that they have it to be able to take back on out. So there's all kinds of issues going on out west. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's some problems we don't have. Well, and they, I read something that was, there was an entire area that over, the, I, I don't remember what it was, but it was, you know, the last 10 years, it was something unreasonable. The whole area had sunk like yeah. inches, two or three inches or something. If the soil was just going out there so dry. So. Um, I see a major benefit if we can get the state and the university to say that you can use this water, then we can not have to expand the land out which means we save money from going to another county and buying to expand. And it's like you're, what you're doing in clearing the land now for the, we could turn around and sell that water to cotton growers or something that's not edible. Tobacco. Tobacco sure. or construction or instead of having to put it on the fields and then we could generate an income and extend the life of the LTS if this should come about in the will allow us to do that. Um, there are a couple of places in the country right now that are doing something similar. They put a water station at their uh, treatment plant and they're selling their water to construction companies and to uh, farmers. So if we could do that in this state, that would be a extend the life of the LTS. And it's only just been submitted, so it's going to be a while till we know anything further about this. Can you it, see cute things see throwing that. some sheep and <laughs> sheep and goats maybe in that deal? Get that part working. So, um, of course, ongoing challenges that we face is weather. You know. Heavy rainstorms, especially in short periods of time, really cause problems. Um, in addition, we have had three lightning strikes this season at um, the land app site, which have called equipment failures. Um, and I think Pete and I sat down and talked about it. I think we've had five lightning strikes in the last four years. So, you know, that's, um, and I don't have any history prior to that, but. You know, if that trend continues, that could be that that is a challenge that we have to deal with. So, we are talking about um, what options we have. You know, whether it's some sort of, you know, for lack of a better term, lightning arrest system or First something that when <laughs> we something that <laughs> yeah, better better grounding. And they, and yeah, they, they work. And the we have a grounding system too. We have the it's, trans and surge suppressors. Yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we got to replace ten of them. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah, that's they take the hit though. They do. Yeah. 
And then, um, of course, field conditions um, related to weather or related to seasonal. Um, there's always going to be repair that has to be done. We're always going to have clogged nozzles that we have to deal with. Um, you know, when you go through this winter, we had several significant freeze thaw events. And, you know, that's, that's hard on plastic. Um, so, you know, those are all go going to be challenges as we move forward. And I mentioned mowing. Um, we spend a lot of time mowing, um, especially during the growing season. So that is, you know, we balance our, our time between mowing and spraying and repair and daylighting. So, um, and, you know, coordination. We, the best time to do all of this is when we can put the most water out. So it's, it's a balance that, um, you know, it's a challenge, but as you can see, I think we're making great improvements and hopefully we'll continue moving forward. Uh, I, mowing's been mentioned so many times and taking Tom's suggestion seriously. Um, it, it, I don't know if we need to make it into a motion or what, but, but have staff look into the feasibility <clears throat> of using goats at some portions of the land treatment site to see if that it, if it's able to be beneficial mm -hmm. is the property all fenced no that's what i was going to say you're going to have a containment issue that's yeah. that was my and question you're have they, they usually have moving fences. yeah they have moving lines for goats i've seen them do it where they literally have them strung out in the line and they just keep moving the line and they do different sections that's really not going to work out there with all because of the trees <laughs> what if you had them in the lanes the the it, it would work, but your your whips are like four feet tall. Yeah. So you're going to have to have something like taller than that to keep them connected together. Or I mean, it, you could put a temporary fence around a particular mm -hmm. pod or a you particular could. area. When they when you think they've done, I mean, it's feasible you can move that temporary fence and, and, and just shift it that way. Now the way it's, I've seen them, it's not a fence; it's a line. And, and I've seen it with temporary fencing. Okay. Where the, where they move the fencing, okay, you're here, okay, now you're here, and now you're here, and they just keep rotating the fencing. It's around. You know, if you call NC State, at. would you, like, at least look into it? Yes. I'd be interested in just knowing at. if it's something feasible. Sure. I don't and think I, that And I actually know the professor on campus for you to talk to, <laughs> Jean-Marie Luganbuehl. So we have, um, you know, if you look at horse fencing now, they have, it looks like a piece tape. of tape. You know, it may be something similar to that, and that does not have to necessarily run in a straight line. Mm -hmm. Electric fences work great. <laughs> <laughs> if you have electricity. <laughs> All you gotta have is a, is a 12 volt battery. Solar panels. So, that's yeah. really all I have for the update. Before, before we move on, Dr. Rashoff, so I got an answer to your question about how many, how much lateral had been rehabbed okay and uh, uh texted william and so i found out is more between 15 and 20 percent better than you had thought there you go thank you anybody else have any questions for wally okay old business tom well look, when do we get to the grease report stuff on there because i'm not sure what section well, that's under that now. was not in this here but we will do a grease report no, it wasn't. It wasn't on the. How are we going to do a grease report? I don't know. It, it, it's on our feet. We're going to do a grease report. Feet? Yep. Ooh. It, 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 yes. It's on the piece of paper. Can you read? Do you have a question about the grease report? or? Uh, I can, 23 violations. And six were repeat offenders, so they were sent the additional fee. And the 200 grease education packets that were given out. I don't know if anybody had the opportunity to attend National Night Out, um, but that was a very good community event. And Pete, along with several other city sections, had actually there was almost a city area of tents set up, and we did stormwater education, grease education, the what not to flush flyer, um, and we actually had to go back and to the shop and pick up additional can the grease packets yeah, so it's a good problem um and it was you know i had several of um our different departments that had those all commented that it was interesting this year the it wasn't like 
the people just took something and moved on. People actually stopped and were interested in what we were giving out and what we were talking about. So it was it was very beneficial this year. Very good. Good to hear that. I have a question. In the last water bill, we got a list of like or some we got a list of streets that were going to be done like Bayshore and all. Yes. Are they looking at? Are you looking at anything that you can do before they redo those streets? We do. We, okay. um, we have, and we could actually bring somebody in to talk about the process, but we go through a whole process before we actually get to the point where we um, go in and rehab a street. Mm -hmm. But part of that is looking at the utilities. We look at historical information with um, work orders, which is why our work order system is so important. Um, how many you know water main breaks or sewer repairs or leaks we've had in that area? Um, we look at, of course, a visual um, visual evidence that there's been issues in the areas, a cut and a patch, um, unless there's a new home, newer home there. Um, and then we look at, in addition to water and sewer, uh, Pete has the camera truck, um, so we have that entire area camera. Um, and then we, we try to look at our as-builts and see what the depth of the water line is and where the valves are located and we try to plan for all of those. And in addition, we actually go look at the stormwater facilities and the curb and gutter too. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we have an extensive effort that we go through. Um, and once we, get to, um, once we get to that point and get into the actual design of the street, they, we do geotechnical testing along the street. So we'll go in and take a core and look at what um, the subsurface is and then look at what technique we should do um, in repaving that street, whether it's just mill off the existing pavement and overlay it or put new asphalt down or come in and mill a portion of it and then overlay on top of that. Or in worst case scenarios, you come in and either um, what we do what we call rehabilitation where we use something to mix in portland cement about 12 inches down and then you roll it let that set up and you pave on top of it um, gives you a steadier and then, base and then worst case scenario is you rebuild it you dig out the street and um you know put new asphalt down new subgrading the asphalt so there are if you look at the list that comes out compared to the list that's in the capital improvement plan, sometimes they're not always the same. Mm -hmm. A street may drop off or, or get pushed back. And if it does, that's the reason. Mm -hmm. We might have to come in and do, um, you know, subsurface work before we can repay the street. Because I know you had done work down there at, um, I can't remember the name of the street down there. There had just been water line work and they're doing the street near there and I was wondering because I know some of those streets are in the down in the older downtown section they are I don't recall which one you're talking about though they're doing Bayshore and the one they did it's the one it's a girl's name oh, I was going to ask if it was Barn because I remember they did Barn Street and Barn was Barn we repaved the street but we did it as part of the utility project mm -hmm. And of course, you know, we have design. bad examples that we don't like, like no. Doris, the new line where we did all of that in advance of repaving the street, but the water line is less than two feet below mm -hmm. or, or three feet below the pavement. Um, and through different things, we had a water issue. We had a sewer, um, a piece of sewer or place in the sewer pipe that collapsed. So I had to go back in. We never like digging up a street that we've just repaved. I can tell you it's not intentional. It's, you know, unfortunately something failed. And, the, you know, the method that we used on doors was a reclaim method where we had that machine that came in and mixed in the Portland cement 12 inches deep. And in one case, we actually, they actually hit the water valve that they thought was deeper. Um, and in another case, um, you know, Sometimes that type of construction can cause problems that don't show up till later. And then the challenge when you when you use that method, the, the base actually sets up like concrete and it gets hard for people 
to track down where the leak is because it'll travel until it finds a spot where it can actually come up and where it comes up is not necessarily where the leak is. So, and in that sometimes once we go in after a leak, we have to actually chase it because it didn't come up where it's actually leaking. Which gets to the, the comment about that, that call from somebody, since we're on air, uh, where somebody had a brilliant green ditch after the rain and that was from sewer leak, dive, sewer dive I, marking a right. leak and it rained and so it all showed up. So if somebody sees a bright green looking like antifreeze kind of color, call the water utility? That's correct. So they can find out for sure what's been going on. Any other old business? New business, Mr. Hanson. I just wanted to give you a, a quick update. We have, as part of um, the upcoming budget, I know we mentioned this during the budget process, but we have um, the downtown water tank will be coming into asset management. Um, the council will have to approve the um, the contract for that because it's a an eight year contract and the cost is spread out over those eight years, so they'll have to approve that contract, which is you know common. Um, but at the council workshop, we will have an item on the workshop to give council um, the choice between of what color they would like to paint the downtown tank. As you know, the downtown tank is uh, a darker blue color um, that matches, it's actually the city blue, yeah. <clears throat> and it matches the fixtures in the park as part of the downtown theme. Um, you know, some of the, the tanks that we've recently brought into asset management, our branding is a light gray color with blue Jacksonville written on it, or Jacksonville written on it in blue. Um, so those are two, so, so basically we need direction from council of whether we continue with the downtown blue or whether they would like to move to the the new brand so or that matches other tanks so just wanted to let you know that um we are bringing the important part is that we're bringing that tank into asset management and that will be on council's agenda too, right? what are they going to do with that water the old water plant down there where the tank is where the big tower is i don't know at this point there have been conversations of you know it would be nice to preserve that building and use it for and different ideas have come up use it as a restroom for the park um, you know there's a beautiful park in front of that building it would it would be a great asset to have restrooms there but it's also not cheap because it's an older building with built built under <laughs> multiple codes ago they, oh, yeah. you know so upgrades would have to be done um, there's been some of the equipment still in the building so there's been conversations of if you could do a bathroom there with you know something where you could see some of the old equipment that actual labels what it was you know that would be a nice amenity so there are faults there but you know it, it's also not it, it, it is a challenge the cistern still in there isn't it yes there is an underground water tank there. Yeah. It's, it is very large. It is very large. You can hear it, yeah. Swimming pool. That, uh, that idea has actually come up. It's got a big concrete top on top um, on it, that, but it was two-piece. You could pull that concrete top off and retrofit it. That. Does it interfere with the um, cell phone towers when you have to paint? We, uh, the company that we contract with, mm -hmm. Utility Services, handles all of that. But um, I don't know if it interferes from a service standpoint, they but it is, down, it is coordinated and them? they do, no, they, they take them down and if the corral needs any repairs, all the repairs are made and that, um, that water tank does have um, cell phone yeah. along with some city infrastructure on it mm -hmm. and the, the, um, our representative from utility services has said that they need to make improvements of that tank so there will be improvements made but that is all part of the budget that's figured in that's all i have sir Maybe. yes sir i have several things i need to bring up planning and permitting updates you should have a copy of it in your regular minutes we did not have a planning board meeting this month but 
in July they had 298 permits. These are for add-ons and such as that. Uh, they did have a 155 Bryn Mawr Road seven unit professional office building and at 1670 Western Boulevard they approved a permit for Verizon Wireless. I have here a thing that passed out on at Anwasa Tuesday night. This, you might want to take a look at it. <coughs> person whose pictures on here has made some disturbing remarks saying he's going to kill people, kill things, about the Charleston shooting and like that. He was seen at the hospital and also gotten over to Troy Terrace. So you might want to take a look at, at the picture on there. It's, <laughs> he's not too, he's not too good. Or he needs to be in the hospital. Yeah, he needs to be somewhere. Uh, let me see, Anwasa. Uh, James, before you keep going, I've got one quick question. 155 Bryn Mawr, um, is that right there by uh, the, the transmission place? Is, is it the old uh, Navy Marine Federal Credit Union building or that empty lot across from it? Of where, I'm trying to think where 155 is. Where is this at? Uh, the 155 Bryn Mawr Road. It's, it's the old Marine, I think. I it's think just it a, is. Just a, the, There's an ATM in the middle of the parking lot. The, oh, so the because you have the, the the Marine Federal that still has the building it's the same that's for sale. Humphrey, Humphrey's moving in storage. They they own it. They're so where it. Thieves Market used to be, and then where the the ATM for Marine Federal is. That's where, where the ATM. ATM is. I think yeah. that's where it is. The, oh, yeah. okay. This does not say if they're talking about the hospital camp in June or not, but I don't see how they could, that man could get on base. Well, that's on Sunday. Oh, that he can walk into Troy Terrace and get by there. But otherwise, he, but that is not for public. Okay, a TT field. Well, no, it was on the bottom of it. It's not for public. This person. Huh? I thought TT field off. Yeah, well, you can walk right through woods and get in there. I mean, really, you don't have to go through the two gates. Okay, in July and June in Anwasa, they approved a 23 unit at Pleasant Ridge and Bridgeport subdivision, six units, and they're both in the White Oak Township. From what uh, Ms. Ray said, they have a number of applications pending right now that will be processed this month. Uh, here is, if anybody wants to look at this, here is their capital project report. There's three pages of it. If anybody wants to see, see anything on there? Okay, Jill, do you want to see this? Sure. <laughs> and uh, I think that's about it for Anwasa. Does anybody else have any information? Mr. Holland, do you have any? <laughs> you want to go <laughs> Jill, do you have anything? I do not, sir. Anybody else? Well, we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. adjourn. Well, let me say one, one thing here. We're, our next meeting will be September the 10th, next month. We have a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Adjourn. <laughs>